I'd like to show you two simple chemical reactions, the dissolving of salts in water. Here I have ammonium chloride, and I'm going to dissolve that in water. I'm going to do it and measure the temperature change as the salt dissolves. So here's ammonium chloride dissolving, and you'll notice as it dissolves, the temperature drops. The surroundings decrease in temperature. That's because this is an endothermic chemical reaction. As the salt dissolves, it absorbs energy from the surroundings. We're measuring the surroundings, and we see their temperature drop. Now let's look at another salt, calcium chloride. I'll dissolve that in water. And notice as this reaction goes, as this salt dissolves, energy is released. This is an exothermic chemical reaction. Now both of these chemical reactions, the dissolving of these salts, proceeded spontaneously. That is, the natural thing to happen, the natural direction, was forward towards dissolving the salts, towards the salts in aqueous solution. But the energy was not a good predictor. One absorbed energy as it proceeded forward, the other released energy as it proceeded forward. So there has to be another thermodynamic parameter that will predict What's the forward direction for chemical reactions? What's the preferred way that chemical reactions will go? We need to find that thermodynamic parameter, and that's the subject of this lesson. What we're looking for is a thermodynamic parameter that will predict the direction of physical processes and chemical reactions. We know enthalpy isn't sufficient. Reactions can go with releasing energy and absorbing energy. So we need another parameter. Well, let's look at this physical process. This is a gas, and we're going to let it expand into a vacuum. Now, we know this goes naturally to expand into the vacuum. In fact, we never notice the gas compressing itself back to one side. When this process goes, expanding against a vacuum, no work is done. It's an isothermal process. No heat is absorbed or released. No energy changes. So this process has three thermodynamic parameters, the energy change, the work, and the heat all zero. There's no indicator among our thermodynamic parameters that this process will even proceed. Nothing changes thermodynamically, as far as we can see. So we need another thermodynamic parameter. Since the reverse never occurs, there has to be something, some driving force, that makes it go in that direction. Yet it's not energy, heat, or work. Well, it turns out a statistical argument is what we're looking for. And let's consider this situation in a very simple case. Instead of a mole of particles, let's just take two. If I have two particles, and I arrange it so that the sides of the flask are different beakers, there's one way to arrange this system with both of them on this side. If I let the particle fly to the other side, that is, I open the valve, now either particle, the yellow one or the blue one, could have crossed over to the other flask. So there's two equally likely energy states for the one on either side, the equal distribution. Two equally likely yellow over here or blue over here states that describe equal, equal distribution. Twice as likely to see this state as both on one side. Now, as you increase the number of particles, the number of ways you can arrange that state where half are on one side and half are on the other increase dramatically. And we can track them because that actually tracks mathematically as binomial coefficients, or we can use a Pascal's triangle to track the number of ways you can arrange the system with equal distribution. The way you do a Pascal's triangle is you take 1 and 1, and then for two particles, you add the two numbers to get the lower number. So uh, essentially, there's a 0 here. So I would add 0 and 1 to get 1, 1 and 1 to get 2, and 1 and 0 to get 1. This tells us, for two particles, what we already know. If you have both on one side, there's one way to do that. If you have one on each side, there's two ways to do that. And essentially, both on the other side, there's one way to do that.
So twice as likely to see the one on each side solution. And you can expand the Pascal's triangle easily. Just keep doing that addition. 1 and 0 make 1. 1 and 2 make 3. 2 and 1 make 3. 1 and 0 make 1. So this would be the 3 particle case, the 4 particle case, the 5 particle case, the 6 particle case. Notice by the time I get to 6 particles, there are 20 ways to have the particles 3 on either side. So here are 6 particles, and I've made them distinguishable so we can tell 3 on each side. There's 20 ways to arrange this. And you could go through there. There's only, there's only 20. It would take a few minutes, but you could say, well, it could be the green over here or the yellow over here with the brown and the blue. And you could keep going and find all 20 of those arrangements. The point is, though, all those are equally likely, and there's 20 of them versus the one way to have them all on one side. So if you had all of these states available to you, one side and two on one side and three on this side, the most likely case, 20 times more likely, is equally distributed. Now, as you go to more particles, that becomes even more pronounced. You get to just 50 particles, and it's already hundreds of trillions of ways to arrange the particles equally on each side. So 100 trillion times more likely to see them equally distributed as all on one side. That's dramatic for just 50 particles. Imagine going to a mole of particles. If you go to a mole of particles, this number 2 to the power 10 to the 23rd is astronomically large. In fact, I would call it bigger than astronomically large because this is bigger than the total number of particles in the universe. So it's just astronomically, bigger than astronomically, more likely to find the particles equally distributed between both sides. We call that, in fact, statistical inevitability. If you look at this system, every second for a million lifetimes, the likely case is the one you'll see. It's these trillions and trillions and trillions of times more likely that you'll see them equally distributed, so that's the likely case you'll see. No one has ever observed them all over on one side. In all human existence and in all our lifetimes, this is still overwhelmingly more likely we'll see equal distribution. So this is actually a measure of the direction that the universe likes to go. That is, the natural progressions of things is towards the most likely arrangement. The most likely arrange arrangement is the one with the most possible ways, the most possible microstates that are all equal. So when we said for 50 particles there were 100 trillion ways to arrange them equally on both sides, that's 100 trillion possible microstates. That's a lot of ways, a very large number of ways to arrange that particular arrangement. It's the most likely arrangement. We're going to call this number of ways to arrange the system, the number of accessible microstates, the entropy of the system. We're going to take the number of ways, the number of equal microstates, times Boltzmann's constant, so Boltzmann's constant, natural log of the number of microstates, and we're going to define that as the entropy of the system. And this is our new thermodynamic parameter. Because when the entropy increases, that's the favored direction of the system. Systems move towards the distribution of states. The more ways I can arrange energy, is the important facet of the universe. I go towards distributing energy among the most possible number of ways. So large numbers of microstates are favored by the universe. That's the natural progression. In fact, we'll talk about this entropy change. We'll say, if you measure the number of ways you can arrange the system, how that changes, the number of ways the surroundings changes, and you measure the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings, you'll find that for all processes that proceed naturally, the 
entropy of the universe increases. So this is a thermodynamic parameter that is not conserved. The entropy of the universe continues to increase for every process that occurs. Processes that occur with an increase in the entropy of the universe are called spontaneous. So now we have a formal definition of spontaneous. Spontaneous is the natural direction of the universe, and it occurs when entropy of the universe increases. Those are also called irreversible processes. That is, we never observe the reverse process happening by itself. Now that doesn't mean we can't make the reverse process happen. You know we could create a system that would have a piston and push all these gases back to one side and evacuate this side. But in doing so, we'd have to bring energy in from the surroundings. And, and bringing energy in from the surroundings makes the surroundings entropy change. So that the overall entropy of the universe, even for that process, compressing it down to one side would still be greater than zero. That process would go as an increase in entropy of the universe. We can be very careful and have processes that occur with no entropy change in the universe. That is, the systems and surroundings just balance each other out, or there's no change in entropy in the system and the surroundings. That would be saying that each side of a chemical reaction is equally likely. That is, there's no entropy penalty for being on one side or the other side. I can be a reactant or I can be a product. Going between the two, there's no entropy change of the universe, so it's equally likely that I'm on either side. That's the definition of equilibrium. If it's equally likely for me to be here or here, no energy penalty, then I'll switch between the two freely. I'll be at equilibrium. Now, entropy decreasing in the universe, those processes are not possible. So now we have a thermodynamic parameter that will tell us the direction of things. If we can measure entropy of the system and the surroundings, and if that sum of the entropy changes in the system and the surroundings are greater than zero, the entropy of the universe increases, then that is the favored direction of that chemical or physical process. It's entropy that determines the favored direction in the universe. Let's consider distinguishable objects in two different boxes. What if I were to take eight balls, each distinguishable, and distribute them equally among two boxes? How many ways could you arrange four in each box? Is that 20, 70, or 150? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, the balls are distinguishable, so it must be the smallest possible number. B, Pascal's triangle extends to eight items, shows 70 in the center. Or C, the number of combination is large, so choose the largest possible. Think about those three explanations and make another selection. We're talking about distributing distinguishable objects between two possible boxes. So here I have some objects. I'm distributing them between two boxes. How many ways can I arrange them so that they're equally distributed? Or in this case, four in each box. Well, you can do that mathematically, it turns out. This is an eight choose four from your algebra. The number of ways to choose r things from a group of n things is given by a relatively simple formula in r and n. But we don't have to do that. We know that we can extend our Pascal's triangle that we had from six, seven, eight things. And when I get up to eight things, this number in the center is the number of ways to arrange equal particles on each side. So there's 70 ways to arrange this system with an equal number of particles on each side. It's 70 times more likely for the particles to be arranged like this 
than all on one side. So the correct answer here is B, 70. Let's look at a system where some mixing occurs. So I'm going to start with objects on one side and let them spread to both sides. The question I have is, as that spreading occurs, which step has the greatest entropy change? So when I start the mixing and one particle moves to the other side, and then I continue to the mixing and another particle moves to the other side, which is the greatest increase in entropy? Going from step one to step two of the mixing, or from step two to step three, or from step three to step one? Think about that change in entropy and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, W equals 1 for state 1 and 4 for state 2. That's the greatest increase in W. B, the last state is the highest entropy. Ending there should be the greatest increase in entropy. Or C, W equals 1 for state 1 and 6 for state 3, the greatest change in entropy. Think about those and make a selection. We're looking at a system mixing, going from all the particles on one side to distributed across both sides. As this occurs, we look at, well, how many ways can I arrange state one? Well, there's only one way to have the particles all on one side. How about state two? Well, any one of the balls could have moved across, so there's four ways to arrange state two. So the change in entropy is natural log of the number of ways, ways final minus initial, or the final state over the initial state, times Boltzmann constant gives me the change in entropy. So I have essentially natural log four in this case, if I go from state 2 to state 3, I go from four ways to arrange to six ways to arrange the system. So again, final over initial, I have natural log 6 fourths or 1.5. Now if I go from 3 to 1 and I do my final over initial analysis, this is actually a decrease in entropy. And the question asks for an increase in entropy. So 3 is out. This is a decrease. It's between 1 and 2, A and B here. And the greatest increase, ln 4, bigger than ln 1 and a half, is going from state 1 to state 2. So it's interesting. The correct answer here is A. And the greatest change in entropy occurs in the initial step of the mixing, not achieving this high entropy state at the end. So the answer here, A. The natural direction of processes in the universe is determined by entropy changes. The natural direction is to increase the entropy of the universe, that is, to disperse energy over as many microstates as possible. But practically, it's difficult to measure the number of microstates. So what we need is a thermodynamic parameter, entropy, but related to a parameter that we can measure. And it turns out heat is that parameter that we can measure. And when you think about heat and work, you would probably associate entropy with heat over work. And why is that? Well, work is a concerted action of particles, all moving in the same direction to compress something. There's relatively few microstates involved with all the particles moving in the same direction where heat is the random motion of particles. And there's many microstates involved in the random motion. So heat is the more naturally associated parameter for entropy. And you can think of that. Here's a ball bouncing. You know when balls bounce, the natural process is for them to slow down, bounce lower and lower each time. And that's because energy is moved from the ball moving in a concerted motion to random motions of a slight raise of the temperature of the surface. Slight raise of temperature, more random motion of the molecules in the floor. 
and of course that robs some of the energy and you get a lower bounce and more energy is distributed into microstates in the floor. That's the natural progression of things. Energy to move into many microstates. Now, if you think about a ball sitting on the floor, we never observe the opposite. That is the ball just spontaneously bouncing because that would mean all the particles in the floor move in a concerted motion, suddenly go to a lower entropy state and impact the ball and raise it off the surface. So balls don't spontaneously bounce because that concerted motion is a low entropy situation. Now, how do we measure this heat and entropy? Well, it's very closely correlated. The entropy change is given by the heat evolved in a system over the temperature. So when a system, for instance, goes from bringing a cool and a hot system together, we can measure that by the heat transferred. Heat always goes from a hotter system to a cooler system. In fact, some people call that the second law of thermodynamics. Heat always moves from hot to cool. Now, you can never get two systems that are at the same temperature to have all the heat spontaneously move to one side. That would be like all the particles moving to one side of a container and leaving a vacuum on the other side. That's not the spontaneous direction, not the favored direction of the universe. So two warm systems, if I go from hot to cool, the heat moving from hot to cool, we can see the entropy change and why that is favored overall. So if we look at our definition of entropy, that is the change in entropy is the heat evolved over a reversible process at a given temperature, you can say, well, what about a hot system releasing some of its heat, so that's exothermic, I've made it negative, and a cold system absorbing that same amount of heat. So the amount of heat released by the hot system divided by the hot temperature, and that same amount of heat going to the cold system divided by the cool temperature. You can see already this entropy change is, is smaller than this entropy change. This has a high temperature. So this negative entropy, this decrease in entropy is small. This increase in entropy, because the temperature is lower, is large. So the heat that moves has a bigger effect on the entropy of the cold system than the hot system. And there's kind of an analogy. Think about it if you were to sneeze in a crowded room, a hot, noisy room. That sneeze wouldn't have much effect. But think about that same sneeze in an absolutely quiet, cool room. Then there'd be a big effect of that sneeze. So you're seeing that same thing. The same amount of heat transferring have a bigger effect on the entropy on the cold side than the hot side. So if you add those two, you find that the overall entropy increases. Now, what if the temperature changes? Well, we can simply add up, divide it into tiny steps, and add up all the individual temperature changes at constant temperatures. So we transfer a little heat at one temperature, then transfer a little more heat at a higher temperature, transfer a little more heat at a higher temperature. The sum of all those becomes an integral. Now, we're not going to do any integral calculations in this course, but you may know if I take the heat, I can represent that as the heat capacity times the change in temperature. And adding all those individual CP delta Ts, I can calculate that the entropy change for a change in temperature is the heat capacity times the natural log of T1 over T2. So the temperature change and the heat capacity determine the entropy change if the temperature changes. In fact, it's very strongly related to the heat capacity of the system. It determines how the entropy changes in the system. So thermodynamic entropy is related to heat. It's related to the reversible heat. But in many cases, delta S is a state function. So we can find the reversible heat, imagine a path that has reversible heat, measure that heat, and use that in our entropy equation. Delta S, Q reversible over T, gives us a way to measure heat 
and calculate entropy, much easier than taking microstates and trying to count them. The statistical and thermodynamic versions of entropy turns out the thermodynamic one much easier to measure. Let's look at the entropy change for compressing a gas. I'm going to take a gas in a piston, drop that piston, compress the gas. I'd like you to tell me what's happening in the surroundings. What's the change in entropy of the surroundings? Does it increase, stay the same, or decrease? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, the volume of the surroundings increases, lowering the entropy. B, no change occurs in the surroundings, so no change in entropy. Or C, heat flows into the surroundings, increasing the entropy. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're talking about the change in entropy in the surroundings when I compress a gas. Well, when you compress a gas isothermally, you do work on the gas. So that would tend to raise the energy of the gas and change its temperature. But of course, this is isothermal, so the temperature can't change. If the temperature changes, the energy changes. So I'm putting energy in to compress it through work. That same amount of energy is flowing out as heat. So work going into the system, heat flowing out, that keeps the energy of the system the same and the temperature the same. But from the surroundings point of view, heat is flowing out of the system into the surroundings. The system is absorbing heat. So there is an energy change in the surroundings. So we can take that amount of heat that leaves the system, divide it by the temperature change. Now, the surroundings is so big that it absorbs that energy without changing its temperature. So the energy coming into the surroundings is equal to the energy released by the system. That's positive. It's an energy coming into the surroundings. So energy of the surroundings divided by the temperature of the surroundings, a positive, an increase in entropy in the surroundings. So that's greater than zero. The correct answer here is C. Now notice the entropy of the system, the gas in this piston, decreases. I squeeze the gas down, I go to lower volume, and in general, lower volume, lower entropy. Fewer ways to arrange a state in a low volume than a high volume. So lower volume of the system at the same temperature, lower entropy. But in doing that, heat flowed out into the surroundings and raised the entropy of the surroundings. So increase in entropy of the surroundings, decrease in the system, and that increase in the surroundings outweighs the decrease in the system. So for overall this process, the entropy of the universe will increase. The system plus the surroundings will get a net increase in entropy. We're talking about entropy and two possible definitions. A statistical definition where I count the number of microstates as energy is dispersed. As energy is dispersed over more equal energy microstates, the entropy increases. Now, there's another definition, the thermodynamic definition, that says as heat is transferred, that entropy increases. So can I rationalize those two and bring them together as the same definition? Do they really mean the same thing? Well, it turns out they do. Here's the thermodynamic definition of change in entropy, the final number of microstates over the initial number of microstates. or the thermodynamic definition, the heat that a system absorbs at a specific temperature. Let's look at those both in terms of a system, say like a particle in a box, a very simple system where there are several microstates available to the system. Now, if you take that system and increase the temperature, that's increasing the energy. So I go from this energy state to this energy state, now, more microstates are available to the system. That is, I can distribute the energy over many more microstates. So that's an increase in the number of microstates. What if I increase the volume of the system? 
Well, you know when you increase the volume of the system, as I increase the length of the particle in the box, the energy levels collapse. They get lower in spacing. So increasing the volume decreases the spacing between my microstates. They get more compact, and I get more microstates by increasing the volume as well. So more microstates accessible at this energy, more microstates accessible at this energy, the temperature increase and the volume increase, a statistical and a thermodynamic definition of entropy, both increase the number of microstates. Both increase the number of microstates, both increase entropy, and the thermodynamic and statistical definitions give us the same changes in entropy. One situation where the thermodynamic definition of entropy, that is the heat evolved at a constant temperature, is particularly appealing are phase changes. That's because phase changes occur at a fixed temperature, and there's a specific heat involved, the enthalpy of either vaporization or melting. So if we talk about the liquid vapor phase transition at the boiling point, we can take the thermodynamic definition of entropy, the heat evolved at a specific temperature, as the enthalpy of vaporization, that's the state function that describes the heat involved with that process, over the boiling point. And you might expect that regardless of the liquid, that this entropy of vaporization is going to be about the same. Because in every case, you're going from a liquid, which has relatively few microstates, to a gas, which has a vastly higher number of microstates to distribute that energy across. So you're going to expect an increase in entropy, and it'll be fairly independent of the nature of the particle. And that's what you find. If you have a higher enthalpy of vaporization, you boil at a higher temperature. The ratio of those two, which demonstrates the entropy of vaporization, is relatively constant. And here I've plotted it for a series of liquid uh, vapor phase transitions. And they all lie on a line. That line has a slope that's the enthalpy of vaporization over the boiling point, And it's equal to about 90 joules per Kelvin mole. So the entropy of vaporization, relatively independent of the particle because enthalpy over temperature represents a state function, the entropy of vaporization, which is representative of an increase in microstates for that transition. Let's talk about the entropy of vaporization of water. Now water, we know, is special for many reasons. But the hydrogen bonding network is particularly important in water because the hydrogen bond in water is quite strong and actually can help orient, limit the number of microstates in the liquid phase. Here I have two diagrams showing how water is slightly oriented even in the liquid phase due to the strength of the hydrogen bonding. My question for you is, how will that affect the entropy of vaporization for water versus other liquids? Most liquids, it's about 90 kilojoules per mole. For water, do you expect it to be about 90, greater than or less than 90 joules per Kelvin mole? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for every answer. A, the liquid is a relatively low entropy state, so the entropy of vaporization for water must be less than expected. B, entropy of vaporization for most liquids is about 90, so we'd expect that for water. And C, gases are similar. Water, though, has a more ordered liquid, so delta ace of vaporization is greater than expected. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're talking about the entropy of vaporization of water. Most substances have an entropy of vaporization, that is their enthalpy of vaporization over their boiling point, of around 90 joules per Kelvin mole. Now, for water, because of the strength of the hydrogen bonding network, it has unusual order in the liquid state, so slightly more ordered than standard liquids. So when you're talking about 
a lower entropy in the liquid, the entropy of vaporization, which is the entropy of the gas, the final state, minus the entropy of the liquid, the initial state, this is actually smaller, a lower entropy, in the case for water. So the entropy of vaporization will be slightly larger. The entropy of the gas is about the same. All the gases are particles spread out and not interacting. In the liquid phase, the interaction of the particles and the hydrogen bonding lowered the entropy of the liquid for water. So slightly lower number here means a slightly larger number for the entropy of vaporization. And that is true, the entropy of vaporization for water is more than 90 joules per Kelvin mole. Now, you may have been able to guess this for another reason. We've seen that the enthalpy of vaporization for water is around 40 kilojoules per mole. And you know water boils at around 400-ish Kelvin. So you could have done this math kind of in your head and come up with the fact that, well, that's closer to 100 joules per Kelvin mole than 90 joules per Kelvin mole. So two ways to approach this problem. In each case, you wind up with the same conclusion that the entropy of vaporization for water slightly higher than for other liquids. Entropy is a state function. That means it only depends on the final and initial state of the system. We found that for enthalpy, that was very useful because we could take enthalpies of formation of products minus enthalpies of formation of reactants, subtract those two to get the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. We'd like to be able to do that same thing with entropies. So we need standard molar entropies of substances. Now, these aren't going to be entropies of formation. They're going to be standard molar entropies because we're going to start all compounds at the same place, at zero Kelvin in a perfect crystal. That's where there's only one possible arrangement and no thermal energy, so the entropy of those systems is zero. Then we'll take and add all the entropies for warming them and changing the phase till we get to the standard state. So let's look at that. Here's the perfect crystal at zero Kelvin, and I'll warm it up to its melting point. And as I warm it, I can calculate the entropy change by using the heat capacity of the solid and the temperature change. Now, at the melting point, there'll be a phase change, but there won't be a temperature change. I will incur an entropy of fusion at a fixed temperature. The entropy of fusion will be the enthalpy of fusion divided by the melting point. Now, Let's continue. Now we have a liquid, so we can warm the liquid to its boiling point, again using the heat capacity of the liquid. And then at the boiling point, use the entropy of vaporization, which we can take from the enthalpy of vaporization and the boiling point. Get to a gas and warm the gas up to, say, our standard conditions, 25 degrees C. At this state, we'll define this, the sum of all these entropies, as the standard molar entropy for that substance. Now we can take standard molar entropies of products minus standard molar entropies of reactants and calculate entropies for chemical reactions. So here's a table of enthalpies of formation and standard molar entropies. Notice that the elements in their standard state, we define those to be zero for the enthalpies of formation, but they have entropies because as you take hydrogen gas, for instance, from zero to 25 degrees C, you incur various entropy steps. Notice as well, as you compare hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen has a larger standard molar entropy than hydrogen. And that's because the heat capacity of oxygen is greater. Remember, the heat capacity is involved in all these warming steps. And oxygen has a higher heat capacity because oxygen, some of the energy goes into tumbling the oxygen molecule. And it requires more energy to tumble in oxygen because of the heavier atoms than a hydrogen. So oxygen has a higher heat capacity. Each joule of heat you add to oxygen goes into rotating that molecule, and it takes more heat to rotate that molecule than it does for hydrogen. So that higher heat capacity 
leads to a higher molar entropy for oxygen. Here are some compounds, and you notice liquid water and gaseous water separated by their molar entropy of vaporization. So with these tables, we can now calculate standard molar enthalpies for chemical reaction using enthalpies of formation, and we can calculate the entropy change for chemical reaction using standard molar entropies. Let's do a calculation where we calculate the entropy change for a phase change. In this case, the freezing of water at zero degrees C. We'll take 10 grams of water, allow it to freeze. What's the entropy change? Well, we know there's various ways to calculate entropy changes. We've seen the statistical method. We've seen the thermodynamic method. If there's a temperature change, also a thermodynamic method, and using molar entropies. So if we can count the microstates, we can use this method. But it's often difficult in any real system to count the microstates. So the thermodynamic methods are often much better. And if you can imagine a reversible path, or if you can calculate an enthalpy, which is independent of path, you can use the heat evolved over the temperature. If you know the heat capacity and there's a temperature change, you can use this formula. Or if you find some data, standard molar entropies for your product and reactants, you can use this equation. In this case, what we have is <clears throat> a easily calculatable enthalpy change for this reaction at a constant temperature, the melting point or the freezing point. So I choose the middle, react, the middle equation here, the reversible heat over the temperature change. So let's just do that. The heat evolved at a constant temperature for the freezing can be calculated by the enthalpy of fusion over the melting point. So here's the heating curve for water. And recall when water melted, or in this case, we're going to freeze it, so we're going to go this direction, you would evolve for freezing, give off six kilojoules per mole of water. So freezing requires a release of heat. So freezing is endothermic. So we can take that six kilojoules per mole over the freezing point, 273. And now I'm going to use positive six kilojoules per mole because this is evolved. This is a positive heat. And I find that that's 22 joules per Kelvin mole of water. But we're not talking about a mole of water. We're talking about just 10 grams of water. So let's take that molar value and use the molar mass of water and the fact that we have 10 grams to find out how much entropy change there is for 10 grams of water freezing. And that's 12 joules per Kelvin to freeze 10 grams of water at its freezing point. Let's do a calculation where we calculate the entropy change for a chemical reaction. In this case, the hydrolysis of liquid water to form hydrogen and oxygen gas. Now in this case, we can use standard molar entropies and the fact that we can calculate entropies of chemical reaction from standard molar entropies of products minus standard molar entropies of reactants because entropy is a state function. Now, we have everything in this table we need, the products, hydrogen and oxygen gas, so we can write the standard molar entropy of one mole of hydrogen gas, 131, half a mole of oxygen gas, so one half times 205, the standard molar entropy, minus the standard molar entropy for a mole of water, 70 joules per Kelvin mole. So we can do that rather simple arithmetic, and the entropy change for this chemical reaction, 163 joules per Kelvin. The natural direction for a process is determined by the overall increase in entropy. If there's an overall increase in entropy between the system and the surroundings, then that's the favored direction for that process. Now, processes that are at equilibrium, 
they can equally likely go from products to reactants or reactants to products. Or if it's a phase change from the liquid to the solid or the solid to the liquid. So what's the difference between a process that has a natural direction and a process that has equilibrium? Both directions are equally favored. Well, it's a balance between the entropy change. So let's look at a place where there's three phases in equilibrium, the triple point of water. Now you might say, well, how can these three phases all be in equilibrium? I know if I go from the liquid to the gas, that's an increase in entropy. I go from the relatively constrained liquid to the many microstates of the gas. And of course that's correct, but the error there is we're only thinking about the system. We need to think about the system and the surroundings to calculate the total entropy. So as you go from liquid to gas, you need to calculate entropy for the entire universe, the system and the surroundings. At equilibrium, that entropy difference will be zero. So liquid to gas transition, of course, you go from the constrained liquid to the dispersed microstates of the gas, that's an increase in entropy for the system only. You know as you evaporate the gas, as you go from the liquid to the gas, that you have to absorb energy. So the surroundings gives up some heat. As that surrounding gives up heat to the system, the entropy of the surroundings decrease. So system entropy increasing, surroundings entropy decreasing, the overall balance is zero, and there's no net tendency for the reaction to go one direction or the other. It's equally likely to go from products to reactants or from liquid to gas. And as you go to the liquid to solid, same thing. When I go from liquid to solid, I release some energy. That increases the entropy of the surroundings. At the same time, the entropy of the system is decreasing, going to the more constrained solid. So a careful balance between the system and surrounding entropies can give you equilibrium situations. And if you're very careful, that equilibrium can exist between the three phases, and that's what happens at the triple point of water. The natural direction of a process is determined by the entropy change in the universe but it's difficult to track the entropy of the system and the surroundings. So we'd rather have an expression that involves just the system. Let's see if we can do that for the water, liquid to water, gas system. We're going to say the entropy change of the surroundings and the entropy change in the system give us the overall entropy change in the universe. And if that's greater than zero, then the forward direction is favored. Now, this entropy of the surroundings, what's happening in this reaction? Well, water liquid is changing into water gas. In order for that to happen, heat needs to flow from the surroundings into the system. How much heat? Well, the enthalpy of vaporization of water. So I can write this entropy change of the surroundings in terms of the enthalpy change in the system. And I'm going to give it a negative sign because it's the surroundings that's sending heat into the system, so the surroundings is losing heat. It's exothermic from the position of the surroundings. I add that to the system entropy, and I get the entropy of the universe. So now I'm in terms of system variables. I'll multiply through this by negative T, and I get the enthalpy change of the system minus T times the entropy change in the system is minus T delta S of the universe. And that minus T delta S, of course, I've multiplied through by a negative sign, so that changes the direction of my inequality. So when minus T delta S is less than zero, the forward direction is favored by the universe. Now this measure of the entropy, minus T delta S, is so important because it's measured just by system variables that we give it a special name. We give this the name delta G, the Gibbs free energy of the system. And when the Gibbs free energy of the system is less than or equal to zero, the forward process is favored. When it's equal to zero, exactly, you're in equilibrium. So now we have a system variable that determines the overall entropy, system plus surroundings, and can allow us to predict which direction is favored by the universe. 
Let's look at the Gibbs free energy for a system. The Gibbs function is defined as the enthalpy minus the temperature times the entropy. If there's a change in Gibbs free energy, if there's a negative change, if there's a downhill direction for Gibbs free energy, that's the favored direction for a chemical process or a physical process. So delta G is delta H for the system minus T delta S for the system. You can talk about that for any system in general, or you can talk about specifically the standard states of the system. If you put all the products and reactants at one molar, if it's a concentration, and one atmosphere, if it's a gas, or pure liquids or pure solids, then this standard free energy difference gives you the relative ordering of those standard state reactants and standard state products. If the standard state products are higher in energy than the standard state reactants, then that's a positive delta G, and that says that the reactants are favored. If the products are lower in free energy in their standard states than the reactants in their standard states, then that's a negative free energy difference, and the products are favored. So you can talk about the various changes in enthalpy, entropy, and free energy. And for a process to be spontaneous, to be favored by the universe, it could have a decrease in enthalpy, it could release energy, or it could absorb energy. Or the system could go towards a higher entropy state, more microstates to disperse the energy among, or it could go to a lower entropy state, where the number of microstates is smaller and I have a smaller space that I can disperse the energy around. But for a process to be favored, the free energy must always decrease. So the entropy and the enthalpy, in particular, aren't actual predictors of the direction of the chemical reaction, but the free energy is always a predictor of the direction of the chemical reaction. If the free energy difference between products and reactants is negative, then I go towards products. Now, I can summarize that and say that for spontaneous processes, processes that are favored, the free energy difference is less than zero. Now, since free energy is a state function, I can calculate the free energy change for a reaction by taking the standard free energies of formation of the products minus the standard free energies of formation of the reactants. So this gives me a powerful tool to determine whether a reaction is favored or unfavored based on free energies of formation of the products and reactants. So I have predictive power now whether a reaction is likely to go based on the free energy of the system. The free energy change, or delta G, is what determines whether a process is favored. Negative delta G's indicate the favored direction for a chemical reaction. A reaction is spontaneous if delta G is negative. Delta G is composed of delta H and delta S and the temperature, so we need to look at three factors to determine where our negative delta G or favored reactions occur. So let's look at some cases. What if delta H is positive, that is, an endothermic reaction. Now that's going up enthalpy hill. And indeed, that doesn't favor it being a spontaneous reaction, because a positive delta H tends to make delta G positive. Now, if delta S is negative, that is, the system goes to a more constrained state, where there are fewer microstates, a more orderly state, then Delta S also is unfavorable, because a negative delta S makes the minus T delta S term positive. Remember, temperatures are always positive. So minus T delta S will be positive for negative delta S. So if we look at the overall space and say, well, what about the regions where delta S is negative and delta H is positive? For those conditions, there's no temperature that can make delta G negative. 
There's no conditions of temperature that can make a reaction that's endothermic and goes to a more constrained state. No conditions of temperature will make that spontaneous. Let's look at a couple other conditions. What if it's exothermic and goes to a less orderly state, that is, more microstates, the energy is more dispersed, both of these favor delta G being negative. Of course, exothermic, delta H is negative. And an increase in entropy, that's a positive delta H times a positive temperature with this minus sign, this term will always be negative, and this term will always be negative. So when delta S is positive and delta H is negative, that's favorable for all temperatures. Delta G will always be negative. And of course, we can look at the other two quadrants. We can look at reactions where delta H is negative and delta S is negative. And of course, those will happen only if T is small. So you have to have a small entropic term, T times delta S. This has to be small and positive to be smaller than the negative delta H to give you an overall negative delta G. Of course, delta S and delta H both positive, an endothermic reaction that goes towards a more dispersed state, those will happen for high temperatures. That is, delta H positive, but you can overcome it as long as you have a high enough temperature and a positive delta S. So we have four quadrants of the Gibbs free energy space and different temperature requirements to have spontaneity or favored chemical reactions in each quadrant. Let's look at a chemical reaction here, the dimerization of NO2 to form N2O4. And if I tell you the reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees C, what can you predict about the enthalpy change for that chemical reaction? Is it greater than zero, equal to zero, or less than zero? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, delta S is less than zero since the number of particles decreases. So it must be exothermic to also be spontaneous. B, spontaneous reactions do not release or absorb heat, so delta H is zero. Or C, bonds are formed, so it must absorb energy, so delta H must be positive. Think about those three and make a selection. We're looking at the dimerization of NO2 to form N2O4. And we're told it's spontaneous, that is, delta G is negative at 25 degrees C. When we look at this reaction, we can predict a couple things about the entropy and the enthalpy. The entropy, for instance, in this case, decreases. And how do I know that? Well, the number of particles decrease. And if the number of particles decrease, the number of accessible microstates has to decrease as well. So if the number of particles decreases, or the volume decreases, or the temperature decreases, all else being equal, those are decreases in entropy as well. So a decrease in entropy means what effect on delta G? Well, a decrease in entropy, delta S is negative, less than zero. So that means this is a positive contribution. Minus T delta S is a positive contribution to delta G. So this doesn't favor. Entropically, this is not favored. The entropic contribution tends to make delta G positive. So we have to have an enthalpic contribution that's negative. That's the only thing that can make delta G negative. So delta H must be less than 0. This must be an exothermic reaction in order for it to be spontaneous. And that exothermic contribution must be greater than the entropic temperature contribution for an overall negative delta G. So in this case, 
Delta H less than zero is the appropriate answer. Now, I should point out that you probably could have predicted that anyway, because NO2 going to N2O4, the only thing that's happening here is the formation of a bond. NO2 monomers become N2O4 dimers, a single bond is formed. And if all that's happened is a bond formation, then that must release energy. Forming bonds always releases energy. Breaking bonds always requires energy. So you could have approached this from two directions. In either case, you get an exothermic chemical reaction. Let's look at the phase change, liquid water going to gaseous water, and see if we can determine what a plot of standard state-free energy versus temperature looks like. Now remember, standard state with this little degree sign, that means all gases are present at one atmosphere of pressure. If there's a concentration, it's one molar. Liquids and solids are present in their pure state. So with that in mind, which of these is a plot of standard state free energy versus temperature for H2O liquid going to H2O gas? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, water always boils, so delta G standard should always be negative. B, the liquid is more stable at low temperatures, so delta G should be less than zero, and the gas has a higher entropy, so delta G should be greater than zero. Or C, the reaction is more favorable at higher temperatures, so there, delta G should be less than zero, and delta G should be greater than zero at low temperatures. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're talking about the liquid to gas phase change for water, trying to plot the free energy in the standard state versus temperature. So if you look at this, standard state free energy is the standard state enthalpy minus T delta S. So in this reaction, a gas is produced, so the system entropy increases. Delta S is greater than zero. If you look at this in terms of a line, this looks like Y equals MX plus B, the standard situation for a straight line, has a slope determined by, in this case, delta S, and an intercept determined by delta H. So if delta S is positive, the slope of this system must be negative because there's a negative sign there. So this slope must be negative. So let's see, we've got negative slope here, negative slope here, so that eliminates B. Delta H positive, it's an endothermic physical process. We know that. In order for liquid water to go to gaseous water, we have to absorb energy. Absorbing energy, that's a positive delta H. That says the intercept of this line must be positive. So now between C and A, here we have a negative intercept. So C is the only answer. N positive intercept and a negative slope. So C is the correct answer here. You also could have come across this at a different, uh, from a different perspective. You could have said, well, water, liquid water going to gaseous water, that's favorable at high temperatures. I know that. The higher temperature you go, the more gas is favored. So one atmosphere, because we're talking about standard state, one atmosphere of gas is favored at higher temperatures. So delta G should be negative at higher temperatures. And the lower the temperature, the liquid should be favored. So delta G should be positive. And that's what you have here. Low temperatures, positive delta G. High temperatures, negative delta G. And that's the only situation where that's true. So two ways to arrive at answer C. Let's look at our liquid to gas transition for water and ask, what is the standard state free energy difference? And remember, standard state means 
one atmosphere of all gases, one molar of all concentrations, and pure liquids, pure solids. What is the standard state free energy difference for this physical change at 100 degrees C? Is it standard state delta G is less than zero, equal to zero, or greater than zero? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, water always boils, so delta G should be negative at the boiling point. B, the boiling point is the equilibrium between one atmosphere of gas and liquid, so delta G standard should be zero. Or C, boiling requires energy, so delta G standard should be greater than zero. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're talking about the liquid to gas phase transition. And at 100 degrees C, what's the standard state free energy difference? Now, standard state free energy difference means, in this case, the difference between one atmosphere of gas and pure liquid water at 100 degrees C. Now, notice we can talk about these standard states at different temperatures. The standard state is just one atmosphere of pressure for gases, one molar concentration for aqueous solutions, and pure liquids and pure solids. So we can talk about those states of matter at different temperatures. And in this case, we're talking about it at 100 degrees C. So what's the free energy difference between one atmosphere of gaseous water and liquid water at 100 degrees C? And I think you could say, well, that's what boiling is. Boiling occurs when there's a vapor pressure of one atmosphere above the liquid. So that is the equilibrium point. That's where liquid and gaseous water are in equilibrium. One atmosphere of gas, pure liquid at the boiling point. So what we have here is where is the free energy difference between the one atmosphere of gas and liquid exactly zero? Well, right here at the boiling point. So the boiling point, one atmosphere, 100 degrees C, the liquid and the gas are equilibrium, the standard free energy difference is zero. If you went to a different temperature, you would still have, and you were talking about the standard state, you would still have one atmosphere of gas. So that's why you say, well, if I go to a lower temperature and I still have one atmosphere of gas, well, then of course I favor the liquid. That's a higher amount of gas, one atmosphere, than the vapor pressure at these lower temperatures. And as I go to higher temperatures, then I have the one atmosphere of gas is the favored state of the system. So delta G standard is a function of temperature. In this case, I'm right at the equilibrium where the gas and the liquid are equally favored. In this case, the correct answer is B. Just like the entropy and the enthalpy, the free energy is a state function. That means I can take standard free energies of formations of products minus standard free energies of formation of reactants and get standard free energies for chemical reactions. Now, here's a table of standard free energies of formations. And when you start to think about subtracting free energies and enthalpies and entropies to get energies for chemical reactions, it starts to become clear why we need these standard states. The standard state being the one atmosphere of pressure for all gases and the one molar for all uh, reactants in solution and pure liquids and pure solids. That's because it wouldn't be fair to take the reactants at say two or three atmospheres of pressure and compare that to the products at half an atmosphere of pressure. We compare everything across the board in a standard state of conditions. So in a sense it makes it a little artificial. When you calculate the free energy for a chemical reaction using the standard state free energies of formation, what you get is the free energy difference between all the products 
at one atmosphere and one molar and all the reactants at one atmosphere and one molar. And that's not necessarily how you set it up in the laboratory, but it'll still help you determine whether overall the products or the reactants are favored. If delta G is overall negative, then the products are favored. So here we have the tables now of enthalpy, entropy, and free energy. So we can use these to calculate free energies, standard state enthalpies, and standard entropy differences. When we use the standard free energy, the result, if delta G is negative, tells us if that reaction is favored, if the products are the favored state. Let's look at four chemical reactions and at their standard free energies and determine are the products favored over the reactants. So our first reaction, potassium solid, liquid water, goes to aqueous potassium, aqueous hydroxide ion, and gas. Is that favored? Well, this chemical reaction releases energy. Delta H is negative. It's exothermic. Delta S is positive, and you might have guessed that because there's a gas released from a solid and a liquid. So that's going to have many more microstates. You're going to have a dispersion of energy when a gas is created. So delta H negative, delta S positive, this reaction will have a negative delta G for all temperatures. This is spontaneous over all temperatures. Let's look at another chemical reaction. This is liquid water and gaseous oxygen forming hydrogen peroxide. Now, for this reaction, delta H is positive. We've actually seen this chemical reaction, but in reverse. We saw peroxide going to water and oxygen. And we know energy is released in this direction, so it has to be absorbed in this direction. Delta S in this case is negative. Again, you might guess that. Gases forming liquids. So this reaction in this direction is never favorable at any temperature. So this one always favors the reactants as written. Here's aluminum bromide solid breaking down into aluminum and bromine liquid. In this case, you have a absorbing energy and a entropy that's positive. You're forming a liquid from a solid, so you'd expect an increase in entropy. So this will be favored at high temperatures, and unfavorable, delta G will be positive at low temperatures. Here's one of my favorite reactions, magnesium reacting with carbon dioxide to form magnesium oxide and solid carbon. This one, it's a little less clear. Everything's a solid, so entropy-wise, it's hard to predict. Enthalpy-wise, this is an exothermic chemical reaction. Entropically, there's a decrease in entropy as you go. So this reaction is favored at, at low temperatures. So we need, since we have this negative delta S contribution, we need T to be small so that the overall enthalpic contribution will have a contribution to delta G that is negative. So this reaction favored at low temperature, unfavorable at high temperature. We can look at these four chemical reactions in the demo, demo laboratory and understand now why each is either favored or unfavored in terms of free energy. So Lonnie can add solid potassium to water. And the reaction of solid potassium with water, we'll see, is exothermic. That reaction produces potassium ions, hydroxide ions, and hydrogen gas. So that's clearly an increase in entropy. So an exothermic reaction with an increase in entropy this reaction will be spontaneous at all temperatures. The reaction of liquid water and gaseous oxygen to form hydrogen peroxide 
is endothermic and decrease in entropy. So that reaction doesn't occur at any temperature. Lonnie can't show us that, but he can show us the reverse, the catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide by the addition of manganese oxide. That reaction is spontaneous at all temperatures. We're in the demo lab with Lonnie, where he has a piece of aluminum foil. Now he's going to shake and manipulate that to increase the surface area. And then he's going to add some brown bromine liquid. Elemental bromine is a liquid. And he'll pour that in. You'll see the brown color. Now, aluminum bromide, when it breaks down to form these two compounds, aluminum and bromine, that reaction is endothermic and it proceeds with an increase in entropy because liquid bromine would be formed. That would be favored at high temperatures. It's easier to do this reaction where we form the aluminum bromide. That reaction is exothermic, as you can see, but it proceeds with a decrease in entropy. The liquid bromine is used up. But because this reaction releases enough energy, it's enthalpically driven and proceeds at low temperature. Although entropy decreases, the enthalpic portion is great enough to drive this reaction spontaneously at low temperature. Let's look at a chemical reaction and determine what temperature range it will be favorable for. So where is delta G negative? The chemical reaction, carbon dioxide and calcium oxide forming calcium carbonate, the formation of limestone essentially. So for this reaction, delta H standard is about minus 200 kilojoules per mole, and delta S is about 200 joules per mole Kelvin. The question I have, what temperature range is this reaction spontaneous as written? Is it less than 1,000 degrees, around 1,000 degrees, or more than 1,000 degrees? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for every answer. A, delta H and T delta S balance around 1,000 K. So below 1,000, delta G is negative. B, the reaction is spontaneous where delta G is 0, so around 1,000 K. Or C, the reaction is exothermic, so delta G less than 0 will occur at high temperature. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're looking at carbon dioxide and calcium oxide forming calcium carbonate. Now, the standard enthalpy difference for that chemical reaction is 200 kilojoules per mole. The standard entropy, 200 joules per Kelvin mole. So kilojoules and joules, a factor of 1,000 between the two. Now, delta S is negative, so if I'm talking about the free energy, I have a minus T delta S contribution. The Minus T delta S contribution with a minus delta S will have a positive overall contribution. That is, delta S minus, T always positive, and a negative sign in front of that makes that contribution always positive. So delta S and delta H balance at 1,000 degrees. They're different by a factor of 1,000. And we can look at, well, what about when the temperature is greater than 1,000 or less than 1,000? Well, greater than 1,000, then delta G will be positive because then the T delta S term will be bigger than the delta H term and the T delta S term will be positive. For temperatures less than 1,000, then the T delta S term is less than magnitude the delta H term. So this positive contribution is smaller than this negative contribution, so overall delta G is negative. So this reaction is spontaneous for temperatures less than 1,000 degrees. The correct answer here is A. Let's look at the standard state free energy difference for a chemical reaction, the atomization of H2. I can write the chemical reaction H2 molecules breaking down into H2 atoms, 
And if I'm talking about the standard state free energy difference, that means I'm talking about the delta G, the difference in free energy between the standard state, one atmosphere of hydrogen atoms, and one atmosphere of hydrogen molecules. I can plot that versus temperature. I need to know the enthalpy difference, standard state enthalpy difference, and the standard state entropy difference. Because delta G versus T is a straight line with a slope, delta S, and a intercept, delta H. So let's look at that. What is the enthalpy difference for this chemical reaction? Well, I don't really have to go to a table or look anything up because all that is happening here is I'm breaking the hydrogen-hydrogen bond and making hydrogen atoms. And if you break a bond, that requires energy. So this is an endothermic chemical reaction. Breaking bonds always requires energy, so delta H for this is positive. What about delta S? I can also get delta S without looking at a, at a table or doing a calculation, because all I need is the sign of delta S, not the magnitude, just like delta H. So delta A S is positive for this. I'm going from one molecule to two atoms. I'm increasing the number of particles. When I increase the number of particles, I increase the number of microstates. I can distribute the energy over more equivalent microstates for two atoms than one molecule. So delta S will be positive. So I have a positive y-intercept for this straight line. And delta S is positive, so T is always positive. So this negative sign means the slope will be negative. So I can sketch out a plot of delta G standard versus T with a positive y-intercept and a negative slope. So this is just a sketch of what the plot of delta G standard versus T looks like for the atomization of hydrogen gas. Let's do a calculation where we look at the standard state free energy difference for the combustion of glucose. And we'll also look at what temperature range is that reaction spontaneous. Now, it's the standard state free energy difference. So for this combustion reaction, we're talking about the free energy difference, delta G, between one atmosphere of carbon dioxide, pure liquid water, one atmosphere of oxygen gas, and pure solid glucose. How can I calculate that? Well, this is a case where you'll go to the tables and you'll look up the standard state free energies of formation for each of these and use the free energies of formation of the products minus the free energies of formation of the reactants. So here it is. I looked them up. Standard state free energy of formation of glucose, minus 910 kilojoules per mole. Oxygen, of course, an element in its standard state, zero. Water, minus 237. And carbon dioxide, minus 394. So I can take now the free energy for the reaction is products, six moles of water, six moles of carbon dioxide gas, minus the reactants, a mole of glucose. Of course, oxygen, zero. So some simple arithmetic gives me minus 2876 kilojoules for this chemical reaction. So it, indeed, this is a very spontaneous chemical reaction, a very large amount, 2876 kilojoules, is released per mole of glucose when it's combusted in oxygen. What temperature range is this reaction spontaneous for? Well, here's the chemical reaction and the free energy difference. Is it spontaneous over a broad temperature range? In order to do that, we need to know the enthalpy and the entropy those are relatively independent of temperature, and they tell us how delta G varies with temperature. So delta S for this reaction, I think we can intuitively say, without doing a calculation, delta S is greater than zero. We're producing a liquid and a gas from a solid and this gas. So we'll probably have more microstates, a, um, more ways to disperse the energy in the products than in the reactants, complicated molecule gas going to a liquid and more gas. The enthalpy, you may know, you've probably seen this chemical reaction, glucose burning, it is exothermic. 
But we don't have to use intuition for either one. We could go to some tables and do the calculations for these standard functions as well. I, I did that for the enthalpy. I went and looked up the standard enthalpies of formation of all these, and I used the enthalpies of formation of products minus reactants, and I showed that the enthalpy is indeed negative. It's an exothermic chemical reaction. So with exothermic chemical reaction and delta S, I have a intercept on the y-axis that's negative for delta G. So it starts out at negative. As temperature increases, delta S is positive. That means the slope is negative. So delta G will start negative and stay negative. The plot will look something like this, a negative intercept and a negative slope. So this reaction is spontaneous for all temperatures. Delta G is less than zero for all temperatures. So this chemical reaction, spontaneous over all temperatures, and a good choice for use in metabolism of life because it's always spontaneous. Let's look at the course of chemical reactions. Here I have a chemical reaction that I've written generically, just A plus B goes to C plus D. And I've used the small letters A, B, C, D to represent the stoichiometric coefficients, A moles of A and C moles of C. Now, as this reaction proceeds, we'd like to track the progress. And we do that by defining something called the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient is the product concentrations over the reactant concentrations. And you can measure them at any time. So Q will change with time. Specifically, I take the concentration of C raised to the stoichiometric coefficient of C and D to its stoichiometric coefficient. Same for the reactants, A concentration to the A power and B concentration to the B power. And I can calculate this value Q at any time. So if I, let's say, plot the concentrations of all the products and reactants versus time, if I start out with A, B and not much product, so a lot of reactant, here's a lot of A reacting to form C and D, so the A concentration decreases as time progresses, B as well decreases, and let's say we didn't start out with much C and D, so they started out at low concentration and went to high concentration as the reaction proceeded. At any point I can take and plot, pick a time, and read the concentrations or measure the concentrations of A, B, C, and D and plug them in to my reaction quotient. So I can calculate this number Q at any time. I just measure or read off the concentrations and calculate a value for Q. And Q will change over time as these concentrations change. But notice, for chemical reactions, the concentrations eventually stop changing. You can see they flat lining here. There's no change with time for the concentrations. So if you wait long enough, these values of concentration stop changing, and that means Q stops changing. It becomes a constant after some time. We call that the equilibrium constant. So as chemical reaction proceeds, over time, the macroscopic concentrations stop changing and your reaction quotient stops changing, it becomes a constant. We call that the equilibrium constant. Now, the equilibrium constant is a constant because the macroscopic concentrations aren't changing, but dynamically, the reaction is still active. That is, A and B are still changing into C and D, it's just at the same time, C and D are changing back into A and B. So macroscopically, things don't change, but the reverse and forward rates have equalized. So it's a dynamic equilibrium. Now, the interesting thing about being able to measure this K is if you do it for chemical reactions, you find the value of K is the same at a given temperature regardless of where you start. So if you start with A and B concentrations high and let the reaction go, Q eventually becomes K. You start with C and D high, the reaction goes in reverse and interestingly, the same value of K is achieved over time. So it's indeed a constant, and it's a characteristic of the chemical reaction. So if you measure lots of these Ks, you can kind of predict where the reaction's going to go. So you could measure Q at any time, 
And if you find your Q is less than your known value of K, then you say, well, wait, Q is too small. So that means the numerator here is too large. The numerator is the products. So if these products are too small, because Q is too small, I should go make more of them. So I should go towards products. So comparing Q that you measure at any time with your known constant gives you predictive power. Which way is that reaction going to go? Same thing, if you, if you measure Q and it's bigger than K, well, that says this numerator is too large. Too many products, I should go back to reactants because I know Qs always go back to the K. If I wait long enough, reactions will proceed, so Q, the instantaneous concentrations, stops changing at this value of K. And it'll progress towards K in a relatively straightforward monatomic fashion. So here we have Q equal K at equilibrium. Now, the approach from Q to K can be monatomic, as I've written it, but it, it actually could also oscillate. Whatever it is, it'll get to K eventually. So Q equals K at equilibrium, and what I have is comparison between Q and K will tell me which direction I have to go to get to equilibrium. I can measure this value of K. What I need to do is measure it at different temperatures because K will change with temperature. So if I do this reaction at 25 degrees C, I might get a different value of K than I would at 50 degrees C. But either way, at 25 degrees C, regardless of how much A, B, C, and D I start out with, I'll always go to that same 25 degrees C value of the equilibrium constant K. So I can track chemical reactions using the reaction quotient, knowing where it's going to end up, the value of K at equilibrium. Let's look at some various forms of equilibrium. Now, Equilibrium is when products and reactants have stopped changing in their macroscopic concentrations. So A and B and C and D macroscopically aren't changing. But of course, A and B is still making C and D, but every time it makes some C and D, some of that reacts back to form A and B. So macroscopically, there's no change in concentrations, but dynamically, the forward and reverse reactions are going on, it's just their rates are equivalent. So A and B forward, C and D reverse, equivalent rates, and equilibrium situation. You can have equilibrium in a lot of different conditions. For instance, a phase change equilibrium. Here's a physical process, water, liquid water, in equilibrium with water gas. Now, this doesn't have to be at the boiling point of water. There's always an equilibrium between liquid water and gaseous water. In this case, the equilibrium vapor pressure of water is just three hundredths of an atmosphere. So there's three hundredths of an atmosphere of water at 25 degrees C, the equilibrium vapor pressure, over the gas. You can also have a gas phase equilibrium. Here's NO2, a brown gas, in equilibrium with N2O4, a clear gas. That's happening here in this flask. N2O4 and NO2, brown, in equilibrium. Now, it's interesting to show equilibrium reactions because demonstration-wise, it's actually rather dull. Because in equilibrium, that's the idea. Nothing is changing anymore. Macroscopically, these all look very static. And that's what equilibrium is on the macroscopic scale, static. But on the microscopic scale, NO2 is still converting to N2O4, and N2O4 are breaking down into NO2, but they're doing it in equilibrium. Aqueous, here's an aqueous ionic reaction. This color intensity won't change because as the forward and reverse reactions occur, they balance each other out. You could also have heterogeneous equilibrium, a solid in equilibrium with its aqueous ions. So silver chloride in equilibrium with solid silver chloride, the ions in aqueous solution, AQ, in equilibrium with the solid. So as a little dissolves, a little of the ions precipitate. And that dynamic equilibrium exists. You can also have, here's yet another physical equilibrium, gas phase iodine 
in equilibrium with iodine crystals, the solid, a sublimation equilibrium. So various forms of equilibrium, all of them dynamic, but all of them from a macroscopic sense appear to be static. That's the nature of equilibrium. Let's look at a specific equilibrium, water liquid and water gas. Now, here I have water liquid and water gas at about 25 degrees C, and they're in equilibrium. There's a little bit of vapor above this liquid. We could write a reaction quotient for this, and when we do, that reaction quotient is the pressure of H2O. That's because the liquid water is pure liquid water, and pure liquids and solids do not appear in equilibrium expressions. So products over reactants, products is the partial pressure of the gas, the reactants are liquid water, but it's a pure liquid, so that doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression. So this reaction quotient is just equivalent to the partial pressure of the gaseous water. Now, that's the vapor pressure of water. When this is in equilibrium, that will become the vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure is the equilibrium constant. So in this special case of evaporation, or the liquid gas equilibrium, equilibrium constants are equal to equilibrium vapor pressures. And we could find those equilibrium vapor pressures. You could look at a PV diagram, and you could say, well, at a specific temperature, that's the vapor pressure of gaseous water. Notice here I've plotted several different temperatures for this gas. So as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases, and you can see that. The vapor pressure is a function of temperature, and we know K, the equilibrium constant, is a function of temperature. So that makes good sense. Now, let's look at the exact value, 0.03 atmospheres at 25 degrees C is the value of the vapor pressure for water at 25 degrees C. So that's the value of the equilibrium constant for this equilibrium. We could also find that on a pressure temperature diagram, a phase diagram. We could look at 25 degrees C and read off the vapor pressure. We would go to 25 degrees C, come up to the liquid gas equilibrium line, that's when they're in equilibrium, and read the temperature and the vapor pressure right off this plot. Now, equilibria depend on the direction you write them. If I write the reaction quotient for this in the reverse direction, now the reaction quotient is 1 over the vapor pressure, the partial pressure of water. And that's in general true. If you reverse a chemical reaction, you take the reciprocal of the reaction uh, quotient and the reciprocal of the equilibrium constant. So in this case, we'd have the equilibrium constant K prime is 1 over K for this forward reaction that we've been talking about. So equilibrium expressions, when we write Qs and Ks, we omit pure liquids and solids. In these physical equilibria, vapor pressure and K are equivalent, and they are functions of temperature that we already stand. If we reverse a reaction, we invert the equilibrium constant. Those are the properties of Q and K. Let's look at a physical process here, liquid water going to gaseous water, and talk about what's true for Q and K under standard conditions. Standard conditions and standard states. So 25 degrees C, that'll give us a standard condition, and standard states, one atmosphere of pressure, pure liquids and solids, one molar concentrations. So I have pure liquid water, one atmosphere of water gas at 25 degrees C, which is true. Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, Q is less than K because liquid water is present and that can still turn into a gas. B, the system is at equilibrium under standard conditions, so Q is K. Or C, standard conditions means the pressure is one atmosphere, but K is 0.03, so Q is less than K. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection.
We're talking about water liquid, water gas in equilibrium. But we've made specific conditions. We've said standard conditions, 25 degrees C and standard states. So one atmosphere of pressure of gas and pure liquids. So that means I have one atmosphere of gas and pure liquid water. What's the situation with this equilibrium? Well, it's not at equilibrium because Q is going to be bigger than K. If I have one atmosphere of gas at 25 degrees C, that's larger than the equilibrium value at 25 degrees C. We saw that the equilibrium value, Q is equal to the pressure of water. And at equilibrium, that's the vapor pressure of water for that temperature. Well, the vapor pressure for water at that temperature is 0.03. But I've said I'm going to go to different conditions, the standard conditions, where the pressure is 1. So I have a Q that's greater than the known K. So if Q is bigger than K, I'm going to go back towards reactants. And I think you'd predict that's what's happened. If you had a whole atmosphere of pressure of water at 25 degrees C, that's too high a pressure. The water will condense until the pressure becomes 0.03, the accepted known equilibrium vapor pressure for water at 25 degrees C. So the answer here, Q, is larger than K. Let's look at the water-gas, water-liquid system and talk about the equilibrium constant for this equilibrium as a function of temperature. So how does K vary for, with temperature for water gas going to water liquid? Is it A, B, or C? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, equilibrium is not a function of temperature, so the line is flat. B, K decreases with temperature because the liquid heats up and expands. Or C, for this reaction, K is the vapor pressure, so it increases with temperature. Think about those three possible explanations and make another selection. We're talking about the equilibrium between water liquid and water gas at various temperatures. K, the equilibrium constant for chemical reactions and physical processes, varies with temperature. So how does it vary for this reaction? Well, what we're interested in is the equilibrium of liquid water and gaseous water for every temperature. So actually, if we looked at a phase diagram and said, what are the points on this line that separates liquid gas, liquid and gas. Well, at every point on this line, liquid and gas are in equilibrium. And this is varying with temperature. So this line in the phase diagram corresponds to the equilibrium values. These are the values of the equilibrium constant with temperature. So the equilibrium constant looks just like that line as it varies with temperature. Now, another way you could have done this is said, well, I know as temperature increases, this favors the products. So K should get larger. It's more likely to have gaseous water at equilibrium at high temperatures than the liquid water. So you could also say, well, K increases with T because I know something about this physical process. Either way, you arrive at the same answer, C. Equilibrium is the condition where macroscopically a reaction appears to have stopped. The macroscopic concentrations or pressures aren't changing. But microscopically, there's a dynamic equilibrium. Products are changing into reactants, and reactants are changing into products. You can approach equilibrium in a variety of ways. In fact, if you look at a thermodynamic landscape, a landscape of stability, often reactions can sit in a rather unstable thermodynamic point, but they can sit there until there's a reaction that allows them to go to a stable thermodynamic point. And we've seen examples of this. For instance, if you look at water, 
the formation from hydrogen and oxygen, the H2 and O2 gases could sit in a balloon almost indefinitely without a spark. But thermodynamically, that's unstable. It's stable from the, from the sense of the reaction is extremely slow, but thermodynamically, the more stable form is water, the liquid. So when you get a spark, you'll form water, the liquid, and that is the stable equilibrium favoring the products. So this equilibrium constant, K, would be large. It would favor the products. K large means products in the numerator are large, reactants in the denominator small, giving you a large K. So large K means the reaction goes well towards products. Small K, the products are small and the reactants is large. So K's less than one, for instance, would be a reactant stays on the reactant side, favors the reactants. Now, how can I approach this equilibrium state? I can do in this dramatic explosion. I can do it in a monotonic approach. That is, a reaction just proceeds. The reactants build up slowly and evenly. The products build up slowly and evenly. And you have a smooth approach. And that's very common. You can also have a reaction where there's a slow initial reaction and then a dramatic approach to equilibrium. So the rate of the reaction accelerates dramatically, and I can demonstrate that. Here's a color change reaction where the color change happens very slowly, and then a rapid acceleration occurs in about 15 or 20 seconds. So let's see that happen. This should happen in about 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, there it is, a dramatic change approaching equilibrium, and now this color will be constant. So equilibrium reached in a step. We could also reach equilibrium in an oscillatory fashion. Here's a chemical reaction where the reaction starts out rapidly and actually bypasses the equilibrium state, and then bypasses it again as it reverses, and then again as it reverses, going back and forth. So let's see that chemical reaction occur. So here's a chemical reaction, turns to yellow, forming, but then to blue as it goes by the products. And now it's going to come back to yellow in three, two, one. There it is, back to yellow. And then I'll go back to blue. So I could plot that as an oscillatory approach to equilibrium. I go by the equilibrium condition, then by it again, then by it in the other direction. There's an overall envelope of reaching equilibrium, but it happens in an oscillatory fashion. There's another instance you could say, uh, imagine have uh, an approach to equilibrium that's chaotic. That is, mathematically, it's very sensitive to the initial conditions. And the up and down oscillations are very difficult to predict mathematically, but again, there'll be an envelope, a lot of changes, but an envelope of approaching equilibrium over time. All reactions, if you wait long enough, will approach the equilibrium. The thermodynamically favored state is the favored state at long times. So we expect favored states to occur if we wait long enough. So several ways to approach equilibrium Either way, they're dynamic. Sometimes we have to wait a long time for them to get there. But a dynamic equilibrium that's stable macroscopically are the properties of equilibrium. Let's look at another physical equilibrium, the solid gas sublimation equilibrium for iodine. I've written the reaction here, iodine solid going to iodine gas. The question I have is, what happens when I add more iodine solid to this equilibrium? What happens to the intensity of the I2 gas? Does it increase, stay the same, or decrease? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A. More solid will create more gas, so the color gets darker. B, 
The solid does not appear in the mass action expression, so K and the vapor pressure don't change. Or C, solid will give more surface to the vapor and it will condense so the color decreases. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're talking about the sublimation of iodine, going from the solid to the gas. And we have that happening right here in front of us. Iodine solid going to iodine gas molecules, and at the same time, iodine gas condensing to form iodine solid. So an equilibrium that's dynamic, but from a macroscopic sense, it appears static. Let's look at the equilibrium expression. If we write products over reactants for this, we would have the partial pressure of the I2 gas. I2 solid, that's a pure solid. And pure liquids and solids don't appear in our equilibrium expressions. So it's just K is the partial pressure of I2. At equilibrium, that's the vapor pressure of iodine gas over the solid. So if I have no solid appearing in the vapor expression, then this equilibrium constant is independent of the solid. If it's independent of the solid, then as I add solid, I shouldn't expect this equilibrium to change. Doesn't appear in the equilibrium expression, the solid, so the solid doesn't affect the equilibrium expression. Let's actually see if that happens. What I have here is the solid and vapor in equilibrium, and I think you can see the solid and vapor in equilibrium, the pale vapor color of the iodine vapor. What I'm going to do is add a little solid iodine and see if that changes. Solid iodine. And we'll add a significant amount so it's clear we've added some. Cap that back off. We'll give this a, some time. But let's look at the equilibrium vapor pressure. Now we know the equilibrium vapor pressure doesn't change. It's a function only of temperature. The equilibrium constant is a function only of the vapor pressure. So we don't expect to see any change. And indeed, adding more solid doesn't change this equilibrium position. Now that might seem counterintuitive at first. You put more solid, how come that doesn't produce more vapor? Well, I did put more solid and initially some more vapor will go into the uh, gas atmosphere here. But at the same time, I've added that more solid. That gives more surface area for the vapor that's there to condense back on the solid. So I don't change the position of the equilibrium. So the correct answer here is B. The equilibrium is independent of the amount of solid. Let's look at the sublimation of iodine solid to form iodine gas. That's occurring right here in front of me. What I have for you is I'm going to raise the temperature of the system. What happens to the color intensity of the iodine gas as the temperature is increased? Does it increase, stay the same, or decrease? Think about that for a minute and make a selection. Let's look at a possible explanation for each answer. A, K is the vapor pressure, which increases with temperature, so the color should increase. B, equilibria are constant, so temperature has no effect and the color stays the same. Or C, iodine will start to decompose at higher temperature, so the color will decrease. Think about those three possible explanations and make a selection. We're looking at the sublimation of iodine solid to form iodine gas. The equilibrium expression is K equals the partial pressure of iodine. At equilibrium, that's the vapor pressure of iodine. And that's a function of temperature. K will change with temperature. In general, equilibrium constants are a function of temperature. So K will change with temperature. We have an equilibrium between the solid and the gas, which is a function of temperature. And we expect that will have an increase in that vapor intensity. And we can show that to you. Here I have 
iodine solid in equilibrium with iodine gas. And we, we can look at that color intensity. I also have a hot plate here so we can raise the temperature. Let's give that a try. There's iodine solid now. The temperature is increasing, and we have iodine solid in equilibrium with iodine gas at a higher temperature. And I think you can see as this comes to equilibrium at the higher temperature, the color intensity is increasing. We have more of the vapor at the higher temperature. And in general, for solid vapor equilibria or liquid vapor equilibria, we expect the vapors to be favored at high temperatures. K increases, we favor the products. So this is the nature of solid and gas equilibria, and in this case, K as a function of T. Let's look at the equilibrium calculation for this schematic reaction. I have A molecules and B molecules reacting to form A2B molecules. So two moles of A and a mole of B form an A2B. And I've got some schematic initial conditions here, the B molecules in yellow and the A molecules in red. This equilibrium for this reaction has an equilibrium constant of 0.25. So what would this schematic picture look like at equilibrium? Well, we can look at that. So the reaction quotient for this mass action expression is the products over the reactants. And remember, we raise everything to its stoichiometric coefficient as the power. So A will be raised to the power of 2, and B as another reactant in the denominator. Products over reactants is our reaction quotient. If I look at that in terms of the initial conditions, the initial conditions are, well, there is no A2B yet, so that concentration is zero. There are three units, or a partial pressure of three for the A, and a partial pressure of five for the B units. So this is zero, K is zero for this. Now, that's less than the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant is 0.25. And when Q is less than K, we need to form more products. We need to make the numerator bigger so Q approaches the larger K value. So we anticipate we're going to make some products here. We can do the calculation, though. We can say, well, here's my quotient. It's going to equal K of 0.25. I expect a to B to be produced, and we'll lose a little A and a little B. Let's see if we can do that analytically. Here's the reaction and the quotient expression for Q. Initially, I have three units. We can talk about these as gas phase reactions. So this is a partial pressure of three for A, a partial pressure of five for B, and the initial partial pressure of the A to B molecules is zero. There's going to be some change as I go towards equilibrium. I don't know how that big that change is, so I'll say, well, the change is a little bit of B reacts. Some X moles of B or X partial pressure of B reacts. For every X of B that reacts, twice as many moles or twice the partial pressure of A will react, because I know they react in 2 to 1. For every B that's produced, uh, reacts, I'll produce one A to B molecule. So the change as I approach equilibrium looks like this. The equilibrium conditions then will be this initial condition minus the change I got to equilibrium. So the equilibrium partial pressure of A will be 3 minus 2x. The equilibrium partial pressure of B will be 5 minus x. And the equilibrium partial pressure of A to B will be x. Now I can take those equilibrium partial pressures in terms of x, and x turns out to represent exactly the partial pressure of A to B. I can put those into my equilibrium expression. I know the equilibrium constant, and now I have three equilibrium values in terms of a single parameter x. So if I put those in, x 
is the partial pressure at equilibrium of A to B. The partial pressure 3 minus 2x is the partial pressure of A to the power 2. And B is 5 minus x at equilibrium. So now we need to solve this for x. If you look at that, it's, it's actually a rather complicated expression in x, but it's actually kind of simple to solve if we use the guessing method. We can guess values for x and approach the appropriate value. So if we just guess x is 1 and then guess x is 2 and see if it solves for 0 0.25. So I'll guess that x is 1. I'll put 1 in for x. That'll give me x, uh, 1 over 3 minus 2 squared and 5 minus 1. And if I look at that, that is 1 over 4. And luckily enough, my first guess, I have a Q that's equal to K. I have this quotient that is at equilibrium. So once one B molecule reacts, the system comes to equilibrium. So now I can draw the new schematic. My X is equal to 1, so I can calculate the equilibrium concentrations or the equilibrium partial pressures. The equilibrium partial pressure is 3 minus 2x or 3 minus 1. So the equilibrium partial pressure of A is 1. Equilibrium partial pressure of B is 4. The equilibrium partial pressure of A to B is 1. So my initial schematic looks like this. One of the B reacts with two A's to form my equilibrium situation. Here's my A to B molecule. My A's have reacted to form that A to B, and I have B and A and A to B in equilibrium. So this is the schematic of this reaction as it proceeds and stops at equilibrium. Now, the reaction will proceed in forward and reverse directions equivalently now. So if this A to B molecule decomposes, another A to B will form. So if this produces some B's and A's, then other, other B's and A's will form more A to B. The equilibrium will be dynamic, but from the macroscopic sense, the partial pressures will be constant. The equilibrium expression is a constant. So this is how we use equilibria and expressions to solve for the equilibrium situation for a chemical reaction.